welcome everyone today. It's good to see everybody. We always start out with a hymn, so today we're starting with 303 in the Red Hymn Book. 303, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. When you find the page, let's all stand together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest i and my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my April birthdays because we're at the first Sunday of the month. So April birthdays, raise your hand. Oh, there's one, two, any more? Three, all right. Okay, so we're going to try our birthday song again. So get your hands ready. It's a clappy. Happy birthday, birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. Do and you the feel Jesus here every day of the year? A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And the best year you've ever had. And the best year you've ever had. And the best year you've ever had. Okay, I have one more thing to say, and that this is a very important announcement or a question for you. Um, does anybody have old magazines that we could cut out of? Raise of hands. Anybody? Okay. All right. Cato, Nancy. Anybody else? Anybody on this side? No? Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm going to get in touch with you to get your magazines. 
And um, we just, I have something I want to do downstairs next week, and I need magazines to cut out of. And to buy them, they're like 20 bucks a magazine. And I said, mm, no, I think I'll make an announcement. So here we go. All right. So I need about 10. You do? Okay. Will you bring them on Tuesday and just leave them at church? Okay, done. Nobody else has to remember magazines. Thank you. Good morning. So uh, I don't have a lot of announcements this morning. The main thing that I have to say is that today is the first Sunday of the month. So uh, we do things a little different on the first Sunday of the month. Um, rather than starting with a time of praise and worship and song, we uh, start with a story, a te personal testimony. And uh, then I uh, do a, a short follow-up to that. And then we spend time at the end in praise and worship and communion. So uh, this being the first Sunday of the month, that's what we're going to do. Are there any announcements that I am unaware of or that I forgot? Yes. Go ahead. All right. Any others? Okay. So we're going to have Richard come, and the children are excused for Children's Church. All right, born June 26, 1957, to Richard Edgerton Chamberlain and Florence Elaine Linton Chamberlain. A lot of people didn't know my mom as Florence. They all knew her as Elaine, but uh, I don't really know the story. There was a story behind why she changed around, but it's... I was born in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, with an English, Welsh, Irish, and Scottish blood running through me, so... Sometimes I do get that way. I do go Irish on, on things, and I, you know, there's a Welsh and all that, and, and it's just sometimes it's not very pretty. But we moved to Randolph in the late '50s or early '60s. Not entirely uh, sure when that was, but and Mom was my primary influence to Christ, along with my grandmother Amy. She came from uh, Wales as a child, uh, as an immigrant. She, they sailed out of Liverpool. And it's, it's, she has quite a story to someday. Uh, Mom was my primary influence to Christ, along with my grandmother. 
they prayed constantly for all of us, all of us, just all of us. I remember her, them both praying. I really didn't know what it was all about at the time, but I, I remember them praying. Memories of my toddler years are vague, almost dreamlike, but I do remember a happy family life. Dad took us to parks and different places. He would go to work and come home, me staring through the window, awaiting his return. If I had a tail, it'd be wagging. I was actually called his shadow because he would take me everywhere he went, and I had to go. I just had to go. Mom took us to church. Dad was not much of a churchgoer, but she took us to the Church of the Nazarene that I found out later in, in, in Pawtucket. I think this is the beginning of my awareness of Jesus. In Mom's arms, I always felt Lord felt Lord, felt loved and secured. But God, through mom, was showing me what it was to be unconditionally loved. Be still and know I am God. And I was going to open with this, but this is Psalms 46. And um, don't want to lose my place. Psalms 46, and you can read that if you'd like together. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, while with their surging, the river is whose this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is with her; she will not fall. God will help her break of, at the break of day. Nations in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations has brought that he has brought on the earth, and he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress. What does exalt mean? Exalt means is a Hebrew word, most often translated exalt or exalted, and in Hebrew it is rum, the word rum. And that means to lift up, to be, or become high. Has God become high in your hearts? Will he? He will if you let him. So be still and let him in. I have let him in. He is exalted in my heart. He has proven himself over and over and over. Every time I get in trouble and I come out of it, he says, I take care of my own. At first, and then it started sinking in. God, I am your own. Thank you, Father. Be still and know that I am God. Not only was he bringing, he, not only was he whatever through mom, loving me through mom, but also through my dad and my grandmother. Very important for a little guy or a girl. The people that God puts into your life are there for purposes of his. He, it's his purpose. Don't take these people for granted. They're there for you. He put them there. He wants to love you through them. Remember that. Don't take people for granted. God is all about family. And this is where the, he starts. He instills his attributes in us 
from breath to death, and we and all we need to do is listen and believe. Believing, believing, trust. Big thing. This is called sanctification, setting us aside, making us holy, for the for He is holy. He calls us from an early age into His family to be His own. We must listen and choose. Have you listened? Have you chosen yet? Time is running, coming short. There is a door that is wide open. It is a narrow gate. But you can still enter it. It will shut, and your time will be done. There will be no turning back. I fear for my family. I fear for the people I know and love that don't know Jesus because they won't see him when that door shuts. I pray that someone hears this and knows it and takes it to heart. So have you chosen? Be still and know that I am God. Memories of the of the move to Randolph, a fire and fuel. I do remember we lived on Randolph Avenue for a time, then a house up on Hospital Hill that my grandfather had built for my dad and for us. From there to Summer Street we went in, Ran in Randolph Village. This is where his exaltation began to grow in my heart. In my preteen and teen years, mom and dad and my grandma were the people I loved and knew. Their love was unconditional. Yes, I would get it in trouble, but black clouds became blue skies very quickly. Mom was so forgiving. She came down hard first, and then forgiveness was like a river. <laughs> it was just incredible. Just incredible. She knew God. She knew him. My grandmother taught him to her. In 1966 came and added Brother Robert John, my brother. And then there was two of us. These completed my inner circle. I remember vividly at night, because her, my, my grandmother's room was above mine. She lived with, with us, in, a, in a, my dad bought her an apartment building on Summer Street, and she lived above us. He didn't like her being there, but that's another story. <laughs> I vividly, at night, listening to my grandmother pray out loud for all of us, individually, for her family, leaving no one out, Absolutely no one out, because it would, she would take her time speaking with him. She would also pray for worldly issues of the day. Mom was the same way. Every night and sometimes during the day, they taught me intercession. That is truly a great thing. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. He is exalting himself in my heart, even now, even still, and he will continue to do this. I now pray for my wife, family, church, church family, and worldly affairs every night. Sometimes I forget on the weekends, and it, but I do get caught up. Um, and last but not least, my, my Vermont family, family, my dad's grandma, grandpa, my dad's mom and grandfather and his father and, and the aunts, uncles, cousins, but just they weren't as, quite as close. And I was supposed to strike that out, but I didn't. Well, no. no. <laughs> the Lord has blessed us. 
I had a blessed family upbringing. I, that is without a doubt. It was pretty jaded. I mean, uh, there was no distortion. There was no, there was no violence. There was no yelling and screaming. And there was none of that. I didn't know that. I just didn't know that. God blessed me. God blessed our family. And he still is. Love and care, I had all the love and care a boy would want. The Lord had blessed us. So be still and know I am God. He is exalting us. He exalted me into my heart. There are always things that need to be worked out on the inside before you can go to the outside to where our Lord has taken us. That's a very good thing to remember. The trials and tribulations we're given, they're honing us. They're, they're whittling away. He's refining us. Don't be afraid of it. The trials, the, the sicknesses, all, anything that might happen to you is for a reason. And that reason isn't just for you. It's for someone down the road. So they may be taught through you. So they may be ministered through you by God. You are his hands and feet on this earth. You are his will to be done through you. Don't forget that. At 25, I met and married my first wife, and marriage was great. I didn't offer much emotional or physical help. That was woman's work. Oh, my gosh. What an awakening I was about to get. I had become all I had I had become all take and little or no give. Is that the truth? In my mind, yes, I loved her, but obviously it wasn't love. It wasn't God's love. Acts twenty five thirty five it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. One Corinthians thirteen four says says in it, love is not self-seeking. I was self-seeking. I did not love anyone with the love of God. I loved him with the love of Richard. All that love and being put on a pedestal had he bolstered that inner sinful desire of me. I call, I call all that garbage me because that's who I became. No, it was not people God had put in my life who was to blame. I, I, I do not blame my mom or, or anyone who gave me all that love and put me up on his pedestal. It's not their fault. It's not. It's just not. I own it. It was just me. Boy, I took it. Through these people, the Lord was teaching me to give without return. Isn't that what he does? Isn't that what he does? Didn't he give us the, the option of yes or no? Wasn't that what the cross was about? Be still and know I am God. But God, as he does, out of darkness comes light. And two wonderful sons emerge from the broken union. One now has a son. They have named him Riley Richard Chamberlain. It's such an honor to me. The other guy, he lives up on in the old homestead now and up on Hospital Hill. Eventually, he'll have children of his own. So one would ask, did you learn 
Have you changed? The answer was no. But our Lord did plant a seed. Yeah, he planted a seed, all right. Through an online dating service called Single Vermonters. Remember that, Deb? <laughs> I met and married my wife for, for, for life, Deb. Her six children and my two sons, though still 50% of the time I had my two sons, made quite a blend, blended family. Eight's enough, that's a fact. That is a fact. <laughs> there was a lot of teaching there for me. A lot of learning. But did he learn? God is good. He is absolutely good. Hands down, he is good. Earlier I spoke, there are things that need to be worked out on the inside before you can go to the outside to where our Lord is taking us. He's taking us. He is just, he's setting us up for what he has in intention. Someone once told me that, 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 that God and the son, the son and the Father were speaking. I think you can see this in John 17. I think that's where it is. And the gist of it was that, that Jesus would, would do this but we had to come with him. We had to come with him. We had to be with him once everything was done. And that was the choice that there was given to us, to either be with him or be in the eternal darkness. He was always been there for me. And, and if one steps out of the box, he knew me. He knew us. Before time began, we were already in the heart and already in his heart, and he and into, has, been, has been just waiting for our arrival into life. He's been waiting with anticipation. My realization of Jesus came in different levels of my life through all the people he put in there. What truly brought him to life is when we joined Green Mountain Gospel. He truly exalted himself in my heart there, here. Be still and know I am God. He's always teaching. Deb, in essence, was a true godsend to a truly self-seeking Richard. This beautiful woman has become a healing instrument in the hands of our Lord. Iron sharpens iron. In this case, Deb sharpens Richard. And in 1996, the working out of Richard's inside had begun. Lord knows how I have wrought much pain, misery, and disappointment and heartache to this lady and family. I took from her and the kids and treated them just as I had treated all the rest that God had put into my life. I took their love for granted. Truth be, I took God for granted. God is love. Any love we embrace is God himself. Taking God for granted is a heavy weight once you realize it. And it wasn't long ago, I don't know, three or four months ago, I was speaking to him, and I said, no, Lord, I didn't ever want to take you for granted. Ever, ever, ever. Well, I did. And he showed me. 20-plus years I have taken this lady, my gift from God, for granted. Does that ring any bells to your husbands hearing this? Have you taken your wives for granted? Have you taken the people in your life for granted? You are taking God for granted. Listen up and learn. 
To this day, I'm not sure I have the degree of putting the smile of putting the smile back on my bride's face. She truly has a beautiful smile. It just lights up the soul. It lights up the place. I fully own the selfishness, self-seeking heart. It is not a heart I want. Christ's heart is my desire. My prayer and lay, much prayer and laying out of hands have been lifted to the Father. And we did this in, in many ways. It had been many years of it. We went to marriage seminar. A weekend to remember, Family Life Ministries up in Burlington. That was a disaster. Still no aha moment. Why hadn't there been a sweeping of my heart? A true cleansing of his of the self-seeking, as because it was because I was still in, in control. I kept taking back the throne of my heart, and every time I did, Jesus politely stepped off. He is very polite. He will step back and let you see. That's how you learn. That's how it drives into you. He's just a wonderful teacher. He knew there was more working out of the inside. Can any one of in the hearing of this voice relate? That doesn't mean just hear. That means Facebook, YouTube, or whatever. Does that relate to it? Can you hear that? There has been there has been over the years a lot of talk, not much show. A lot of talk and not much show. I didn't walk the walk, walk the talk. In, in Deb's heart, there is no trust in my word, absolutely none. There has been endless talk and no or little walk. As husband, your word must be true and trustworthy. Top ingredient for a marriage. This is what a wife desires, desires, and not only the desires, but she deserves that. I had a problem with the word deserve. Because as I read it, the only thing we deserve is death. But deserve has many meanings. Your marriage will struggle endlessly or die without it. The trust and the trustworthiness. Your word must be firm with love. It must, she must be able to trust you. Deb and Richard both agree to enter into the covenant of marriage that our Lord ha has, by his grace, offered to his people and the church. His people and the church. And by his grace, our marriage still lives today. Praise God. I am so un unworthy of this. Be still and know I am God. Our Lord is still working out what is on the inside before he takes us forward on the outside. Deb is undoubtedly an outstanding daughter of the Most High. I am a very blessed, foolish man that deserves not such a lady. I was given a word a year ago or so from our Lord through my life mentor and good friend, Kenny Smith. Smitty to some. We both grew up in the same neighborhood. We both ran together, but we also ran in different paths. His was a little stronger than mine. But I didn't run with good people. I love my brother, Kenny. And I miss him. 
and Angie. And that word that the Lord gave him, me through him was that, in essence, to clean my spiritual closet before you can be taken forward. Wow, what was this about? What did this message mean? Well, it wasn't until just recently the Holy Spirit explained to me, and this was just recently, that he, that my closet was my heart. And the, and the, and he, and the sins of my life were to be dealt with. The sins that I have left in my heart that I hadn't dealt with were about to be dealt with. And he, the Spirit, would be do the sweeping. Be still and know I am God. He loves me. But it wasn't just for me. It was for everyone. My response was, yes, reveal these sins to me, Lord. Break the chains that bind my selfish heart. Cleanse me so you may take me forward. So my faithful companion, the Spirit, began to work. A little longer. <laughs> Thoughts and visions started to enter me. I didn't think much about it at first, but God reset the breaker of my heart. And oh my, I got it. Individually, these sins were replayed in my heart. They just popping up in, 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 in thoughts and visions. And just words that came out in, from people. And, oh, that's how he works. Well, that's how he works in me. <laughs> he may work, talk to you differently, but everyone's different. Repentance was not comfortable. I had to face these things. Pride had to die. But yes, Yes, Lord, now I see it. I was so wrong. Please, Lord, forgive me. Clean my heart. That was my, my reply to him. The word narcissism, well, let me back up a little. Nothing happens without repentance. The Lord doesn't move. And it's not just repentance. You have to have a repentant heart. Uh, uh, attitude of yes, what I that's wrong. I was dead wrong, and and oh my Lord, please forgive me. And He does. He forgives. He's a resurrecting God. The word narcissism would come to my mind, and I would just brush it off. It would come up different ways. And, but I would just brush it off as, oh, yeah, how wrong and hurtful behavior like that would be, that that would be. Yet I didn't read that in children, yet I did read after looking it up. I did read that in children who had been given overabundant affection were susceptible to this behavior. Oh my, I'm there, that was me. Hired to face, but that was me. I had a, a, a level of narcissism And that's as far as I, and yes, I am overly selfish. I am self-seeking. But to this level, no, not I. 
I couldn't, I was denying it. I was denying it. There are numerous levels of this mental illness. And I was put on a pedestal, like I said that, and I got denied. And I just denied it all over time and went, uh, me praying for self, and, and time, as time went on, me praying for the selfish heart to be cleansed by God, sin has to be revealed before it can be dealt with. Be still and know I am God. A few months ago, Deb and I were headed to Burlington. I think car shopping, I think. I brought up the fact that a lot of prayer had been lifted up asking for my selfish heart to be cleansed, yet my behavior hadn't changed, and I now was asking for the Lord to reveal to me what the problem was. I knew there was a problem. I knew there was much prayer given, lifted up, but nothing, nothing had changed. Our Lord is faithful answering questions in his own time. And he answered mine through Deb. Two or three months prior to the to our ride, he had given Deb a word through the, through the feeling that Richard has more than a selfish heart. He showed her the word narcissism, and it frightened her. So she kept it to herself. She was afraid that I would get mad. I heard it so much. She kept it to herself till until then until our ride conversation opened the door. My question had been answered. Cause she she spoke that to me. She spoke she had felt that I was a narciss had narcissism and she was afraid to say that. Our love for God, Deb, family and church wasn't fake. It isn't fake. As, fr as from an early age, love can be crafted and cultivated by sinfulness. And that's what happened with me. Sinfulness, worldliness, and Satan. These three influences will destroy you if the lie of me becomes your own. And it became my own. I believed it. Two more people. My love was true and real to me, but it was twisted and conditional. I craved a return, some sort of pat on the back, some kind of accolade, forgiving. This is not God's love. His love is self-sacrificing and unconditional. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Was I patient? Love is kind. I was kind, but I could be kinder. It does not envy. I envy a little. It does not boast. I don't think I boast. Maybe I do. It is not proud. Not quite sure about it. He does not dishonor others. I don't I try not to dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. I am self-seeking. Or have been. It is not easily angered. No, I'm easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I don't, I guess I do keep record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. That I can say I like. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And I like to say, God love, God's love never fails. It just does not fail. He's got your back. You need not worry, even though you do. I went down the list and asked my soul, have you been these? My answer was no. Please do the same for yourself. Please do the same for yourself but ask with a repentant heart, a repentant heart, a true 
I want change. And, and Lord, I've been so wrong. God doesn't move if repentance is not present. Ask for forgiveness and trust God's love. Trust is the key. Lord willing, he will move. He takes care of his own, and I am his own. I am. Is that boasting? Well, I think it's a good boast. Am I proud of that? Yeah, I'm proud of my Lord. He will take care of you also. If you haven't asked him into your heart to be your personal savior, please ask him today. Time is short. You can see the weather is, is being through him. The earthquakes, all that you can read. You can read it it's in black and white. All you got to do is pick up the word. It's there. It's there. So, Deb, church, I ask for your forgiveness, and I trust our Lord will move in my heart to remedy the, the change Richard's love to God's love. That is the d desire of my heart, to have Christ's heart, to live with love with his. Be still and know I am God. He is surely exalted in my heart. He surely is. And I pray he is exalted in your heart. Um, thank you. Seven minutes over. So if you boast, let your boast be in the Lord, right? Amen. Praise God. We're all a work in progress, and um, there's um, definitely true for, for Richard. It's definitely true for the rest of us. So um, I'm going to do things a little different this morning than I typically do after uh, someone speaks. Uh, Richard spent quite a uh, lot of time on marriage and what that has looked like for him. And so I want to I wanna speak about marriage this morning from Ephesians chapter 5 and um, see what the Lord has to say to us in uh, light of what Richard has shared, but also in light of what Paul shares here with the uh, Ephesian church. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through tw uh, 33. And um, I'm going to read um, that, and you can follow along with me up on the screen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives. Now, <clears throat> notice that I did not leave out verse 21. A lot of times people that are talking about this start with verse 22, but I don't think you can leave out verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So, 
earlier in this chapter, Paul, in verse 18 of uh, chapter 5, Paul talks about being filled with the Spirit. So submitting, he, go, he goes from being filled in the Spirit and then starts talking about submission and that we should mutually submit one to another. So submitting is part of being filled with the Spirit. What's that mean? What's that look like? Well, Paul says it pretty clearly here. <clears throat> Although um, it has been twisted, it has been misrepresented, it has been misused horrifically in some areas of Christianity in regards to what the husband and wife relationship looks like, and usually all for selfish purposes, um, which we've heard a little bit about here this morning. So <clears throat> to correctly understand verses 22 and 23, when he's talking to the wife, we need to include verse 21, because we mutually submit one to another, not just in the marriage relationship, but in all of our relationships, that's what it should look like, because it is so far-reaching. Um, <clears throat> mutual submission, uh, as we submit to one another, is what the submission in the Godhead looks like, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the, spiritual, <clears throat> um, the spiritual aspect of this is, is tremendous, not only in our relationship with Christ and our relationship with God, but also in our relationships with un one another, especially in marriage and in families. <clears throat> uh, so Christ, in Christ, is the key. The, the, Paul says that we submit to one another in Christ. He talks to the, the wife, and, and he says that she is to submit in Christ. So a Christian marriage or a Christian family, in other words, a marriage and a family that is filled with the Spirit, uh, will not only be intact, but it will be healthy and productive for the kingdom. Um, I think because of the culture that we live in, we sell ourselves short in regards, sell ourselves short way too often in regards to the influence that a Christian family can have on our culture. And I think that it's very important in the culture that we live in for Christian families and Christian marriages to influence those around them. <clears throat> we forget that God has ordained marriage and family to be that very thing, to be the backbone of society. He has ordained that. He ordained it from the beginning with Adam and Eve, and he continues to do the same thing today. And if we look at our, our issues of today in our culture, at-risk children, foster care system, the, the amount of kids that are latchkey, the, the amount of children that, are, that crave this kind of um, love and uh, nurturing and this type of structure and order that God has ordained, um, it's very evident uh, the effects that it has on a society. The lack of that leaves tremendous holes uh, for, for children to be, um, to wrestle with, uh, hopefully not for the rest of their lives, but often that is the case. <clears throat> Submission is so often considered and thought of in a negative light, especially in regards to this scripture in regards to the husband and wife relationship. And I hope that today you will leave with a different perspective and a different attitude about submission, that it, it will be something that's positive, something that you realize is, brings a blessing that can only come uh, through that order that God has ordained. Especially as we look at uh, these two verses, wife, submit, your husband, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Oftentimes, that is very negative in the context of our culture, our society. And yet, it's something that should be very positive and something that should be 
uh, <clears throat> real, that we should realize brings blessing and honor to us in that relationship. Basically, what Paul is saying here is there is a mutual love and submission and, in, and a divine order in the marriage relationship, in the husband and wife relationship, in the family structure. And as I mentioned before, where is that first seen in the Scripture? It's seen in the, in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Scripture is very clear that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in relationship with one another, and there's an order there. There's a submission there, if you will, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, it says, Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God, or the Father. And so there's that order that has been always there from eternity past, and that God desires to see in his creation that he is placed here on earth. And I'm going to make a statement now that I'm going to repeat at the end that I think is critically important in regards to this relationship. Love submits to love. Love submits to love. Love does not submit to abuse. Love does not submit to manipulation. Love does not submit to the brute force or any other kind of ungodly conduct. And so the wife submits to love. The church submits to love. Love submits to love. So, <clears throat> in the Greek, this entire portion that I read earlier from Ephesians chapter 5 is one sentence. Get that. In our, in our Bibles, it's multiple sentences and at least uh, three paragraphs. But in the Greek, it's one sentence, it's one thought. And so the idea of mutual uh, submission runs throughout that entire thing that Paul has to say about marriage. And so the structure would read something like this in the Greek. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands to your wives in love as Christ loved the church. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, husbands aren't supposed to submit to wives. Heaven forbid. But if you read that Greek there, that's what it's saying, that there's a mutual submission. One is, and the one coming from the wife to the husband is out of love, and the one coming from the husband is because of his love for Christ that is then shown to his wife. So, what is more submissive than giving your life for someone else? Think about that. Paul says that the husband should love his wife as Christ did the church, that he gave himself up for her. And so the wife should do the same. Give his life for his wife. What is more submissive than that? So why has the devil tried so hard and been so successful at perverting this very foundational principle of God? Why? Why has he done, why has he done it and why has he succeeded? <clears throat> If he does it, then he perverts and destroys a very basic principle of God's relationship to mankind. God's relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to mankind, his creation, and to the church. So, 
bottom line, it doesn't really matter how perverted it has been. It doesn't really matter how successful Satan has been at perverting this. The facts are still true. The principle still stands. No matter how politically, politically incorrect it might be to use the word submissive, especially in light of these relationships, the facts still remain. God established an ordered equality between men and women, between husband and wife, an ordered equality. There's an ordered equality in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Things happen in order, and yet... Jesus says over and over again, we are one. The Father and I are one. I am in him, he is in me. The Holy Spirit is one with us. He will be sent to you to bring glory to the Father and the Son. There, we are one. And so there's that ordered equality. Not superiority and not inferiority. It's an ordered equality. In the Godhead, and it's also the same in a marriage and a family. How this order works out in every marriage is different, but God has given us a foundation for it to be built upon. So, work it out. Don't throw it out. Work it out. Don't throw it out. This order brings blessings from God as it does in the Godhead. Jesus says over and over again when he was here on earth, what I hear the Father saying, I say. What I see the Father doing, I do. My, work is to, my uh, purpose is to do the work of my Father. My food is to do the will of the Father. Over and over he says that. That's submissive. That's submission. But it's out of love and because he knows that there, in that is blessing, blessing beyond what we could even understand. <clears throat> Always this order brings the blessings of God, does in the Godhead, and it will for us. Why is Paul so often accused of being a woman hater? or a sexist, or narrow-minded. Maybe some of you haven't had those conversations, but if you get into a conversation with uh, certain people, especially non non-believers, about the writings of Paul, those things will very quickly come up. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, Peter says he is misunderstood on purpose. To pervert the scriptures. Think about that. Peter writing says that Paul's writings are misunderstood intentionally to pervert the very scripture, the very word of God to his creation. So he's probably not, maybe often he, well, let me rephrase that. Maybe sometimes he's misunderstood. But probably more often than not, he's intentionally misrepresented because the world doesn't want to acknowledge God's ways. The world doesn't want to acknowledge God's ordained purposes in, for us as men and women, as husbands and wives, and for the family. Understand that what Paul is writing here is re revolutionary. It's not something that was said at this point in time in history. In that day, women, and especially wives, were taken for granted, unimportant, had no authority. It was better to have them seen and not heard. They were to bear children, take care of their man, while the man did as he pleased which might include, or and often did include, having other women. Especially 
in pagan cities like Ephesus, which this is written to. Uh, in F- if you look at the history of Ephesus, especially at that time, it was a very perverted city. For Paul to say that men and women are equal, that they need to mutually submit one to another, that they, their wives are to be more important than the man's own life, that was unheard of. It was abhorrent to them. Them were fighting words. And yet Paul wrote it to this culture because he was writing to a church who had been liberated by Jesus Christ and needed to live differently than what their culture said was okay. The liberation of women did not come from the women's liberation movement. Sorry. (laughs) Didn't come from the feminist movement. It came through Jesus Christ. Came through Christianity. And that's still the same today. Will not change. If you don't believe it, look at the Middle East, and especially Islam and other religions. How do they treat women? Very oppressive, mean-spirited. We dare not think, and we especially dare not promote the idea that Paul is instructing women to submit to abuse. Never was that his intent. Never was that the heart of God. Never will that be the heart of God. But rather, they are submit to submit as to the Lord. Submit as the church does to Christ. Submit to love, care, sacrifice, selflessness. That's probably something that would be desired by most women, I would think. At least my wife tells me. (laughs) In Luke chapter 22, 26, I'll close with this. Jesus says, don't be like the world. Don't desire to lord it over anyone. He's speaking not to just individuals, not only to the church, not only to his disciples, but he's speaking to every man that was a husband or has been a husband. The Greek there says to be a servant leader, to be a provider, a protector, and even carries the understanding of being savior. So Paul and the Holy Spirit are speaking to Christian couples who are honoring God and honoring one another, who have pledged to each other and have the privilege of illustrating by their godly union and relationship the greatest story of all time. Our marriages should relate to our culture and our society the greatest story of all time. Because we are submitting to one another out of love for Christ. And that greatest story is Christ and his love for the church. The, uh, in Paul's writing here in Ephesians, the husband is lucky, likened to Christ and the wife is likened to the church. So what's the answer to our current state of affairs in America? What's, our, what's the answer to the current state of affairs in the world? To single parent families, domestic violence, dysfunctional families, abuse, neglect that are plaguing this world we live in? Isn't it just that? Godly Christian families. Godly Christian marriages to serve as models to the rest of the world, to 
that they would have something to emulate, something to go by. And I'll end with what I said I'd end with. Love submits to love. That's what we're going to celebrate here in a little while in communion. Love submitting to the love of the Father. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Hanging on the cross, his last words, it is finished. I have accomplished what I was sent here to accomplish. Submission to the heavenly call, the heavenly vision, the heavenly desire to see man redeemed and relationships redeemed and making a difference in the world in which we live. Amen? Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. If the music team could come now. Lord, we thank you that, the, that your word is truth that never changes. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your desire, your order, your ordained purposes for us as individuals, as husbands, as wives, as families. It's always been the same and always will be the same. Lord, may we bring glory and honor to your name. May we represent exactly what your desire and purpose for mankind is that you would be exalted, that people would come to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and join in worship.
Love never fails, never gives up on me or you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, <clears throat> For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For, when you, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you provide the Lord's death until he comes. He is returning. He's coming back. And until then, we honor him, we celebrate him, we celebrate his death and his resurrection in communion. And so, <clears throat> as they're playing this next song, I invite you to come, partake of the emblems here at the table, and uh, remember that he is returning, but until then, we get the privilege of proclaiming his death and his resurrection until he comes. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son. Jesus, we thank you that you came. You knew what you were coming to. You knew what you were coming for. While you were here, you faced horrendous agony, and yet you said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And you accomplished, finished, what you came to accomplish. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning, that we have been redeemed by your sacrifice, by your broken body and your shed blood. Thank you that you're seated today in the heavenlies, the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Thank you for that. In your most powerful name, amen. Amen. Come. You surround me with the sun. 
need him? We sure do. Praise God. So <clears throat> Richard wanted to close with a prayer. Before we do that, we'll receive this morning's offering. Um, Dan's going to put the prayer up, and um, then we'll join Richard in praying that. Could I have the ushers? Handsome couple. Would you pray? Amen. As they're receiving that, could we just, yeah, play, sing that one more time. Sorry. It's appropriate uh, to lead into this prayer, Richard. So um, turn your mic back on if you would. I see light. I see light. Have we seen the light? So would okay. you stand with us? Yeah, please stand. This is a prayer for the church. It's, um, it's the prayer of Jabez. And you can find him in Chronicles 1, 9, 4, 9 through 10. And uh, here's, he's got quite a story. I was going to say a little bit about it, but uh, that's a little lengthy. There is a preacher theologian that, spoke the words and they have resonated in my heart that he said that God is most glorified when we are most satisfied are you satisfied are you satisfied with him seek him out if you don't know him Dear Heavenly Father, 
please bless us indeed. Enlarge the scope of our ministry for you. Amplify our vision for the church. Expand our faith in your word and cultivate our lives in prayer. In our lives, gracious master, bestow your power, manifest your presence, and grant your protection every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, we come before you, and you asked this years ago. We come to you as one. One thought, one mind, and that is Jesus. We thank you for this day, and bless you for what you will do with us. Thank you, Father. Please go in peace. Be the church not just here, but outside, beyond those doors. That's what this world needs.